Welcome back to Teach From Home. I'm Beth and I am continuing to go through Discussing Instead of Education by John Hull. And I have to be honest with you, I have read so many of his books and I'm finally getting to this one. And I have to say that I think that this is my favorite one of his. And I wish that I could go back and read this one first. It's just chock full of all of the amazing viewpoints that he has about teaching and school and how we can teach our kids in a different way. There are so many alternatives that actually work best for our kids. So I'm loving this. And what I'm going to talk about today is his distinction between a teacher with a capital T and a teacher with a lowercase t. And if you watched my previous video, I talked about how he talks about the school with the capital S and a school with a lowercase s. So there's a distinction between what some schools can be and what the traditional schools are. So we're talking about two different types of teachers. And it's very important to make this distinction, right? Because I wanted to be a school teacher. Why? Not because of the great pay, because it doesn't pay great. Um, not for all the, the summers off, because that's such a huge myth about teachers. No, I wanted to be a teacher because from a very early age, I loved working with kids. It was just a gift that I had. It was something that I enjoyed doing. I loved inspiring kids. I loved showing kids how to do new things. I loved seeing that light bulb moment when they finally, something clicked and they finally got something. And I just loved getting to make them excited about learning. And so that's why I was like, teaching just seems like that's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and be a classroom teacher. So I got my degree in that. But what I realized was that I wasn't going to get to be the teacher, the lowercase t teacher in a classroom because they are different. So I wanted to share what he defined as the two different kinds of teachers. So he says, the lowercase t teachers are people helping doers do what they have freely decided they want to do. That's what a lowercase teacher does. A uppercase teacher is people trying to make others learn what others have decided they ought to learn. So let me say that again. Lowercase teachers are people that are helping other people that want to do things. They're helping them do what they have freely decided they want to do. But the uppercase teacher are people trying to make others learn what others have decided that they ought to learn. Do you see the difference? It's so important. Again, we're getting back to that compulsory learning, right? It is forced and it is compulsive. The kids do not have a choice when they go to school about what they're going to learn and how they're going to learn it. None of that is up for debate in schools. Everybody else gets to choose for the students what and how they're going to learn. So we've talked about how there are different ways to have schools. And now there are different types of teachers. So here's a quote from the book. Uh, instead of education, it says the difference between teachers and teachers, uppercase teachers and lowercase teachers, has nothing to do with philosophy, methods, or personality. Whether the teacher is easy or demanding, kindly or harsh, interesting or dull, friendly or cold, it has to do with the degree to which the students are free to choose to spend time with him or her or not to do what he is doing, use his help, listen to and accept or reject his ideas. And I think it's so important to understand that it all comes back down to a student's freedom. Children have no freedom inside the classroom. From the moment they step foot in the building, their choices are all made for them. They don't get to decide which teacher they have. They don't get to decide what they are going to learn about. They don't get to decide how they're going to learn that. They are not allowed to disagree with their teachers. They're not free to leave whenever they want and come back whenever they want. None of that is their choice. So it comes back to students' freedom. And why this distinction is so important is because when you have a classroom teacher the uppercase teacher, 
it says students have no reality of encounter with their teachers. And what it means is teachers can't be themselves. They can't share their personal beliefs or what they enjoy outside of school or in their personal life. They can only talk about what the curriculum and lesson plans tell them to. They do not respond naturally and honestly to the acts and needs of children, but only as the rules tell them to respond. They ask themselves all the time, if I do this or say this or let the students do this or say that, will I get in trouble? And it says, this is a quote from the book, it says, the newspapers often tell of teachers who were fired for saying things the community did not like. No one is fired for hiding the truth from children, but many are fired for telling the truth. I think that is such a huge statement, considering that he was talking about this in the 70s, and now that we are here in the current present, (laughs) the things that are getting banned from schools, the things that teachers are getting fired for, I mean... These people who have dedicated their lives to training up and teaching our next generation are getting fired for things that I don't believe they deserve to be fired for. Books are getting banned that I don't believe should be banned. Um, And so teachers really have to walk a fine line. And they definitely cannot be themselves, especially with their own personal beliefs that might contradict the beliefs of parents and It's so I get that. I totally agree with what he's saying that teachers and students can't really have a real relationship, especially when he talks in another area about how the teachers have power over the students. You know, it's not one of these mutual relationships where the child is just talking to an adult and the adult can can talk back and they can just have a conversation where they're both being honest and they're both just sharing information and talking about something rather than, you know, instead it's the, the teacher who is powering over the child and they get to decide what they're going to discuss. They're going to ask them questions that they expect the correct answer from and they are also the one that is grading and ranking and labeling the child. And so there is no real relationship there. And I can tell you when I was in school, I went to traditional school all of my life and then I went to college and a university and there were teachers in my school that definitely had the most positive impact on me. They were truly the ones that inspired me to become a teacher in the first place because I saw their passion for teaching. I saw that they truly enjoyed what they were teaching us and they truly liked us as students. I could tell that they wanted all of us to succeed. They were compassionate toward us. They were helpful. They were patient with us. They made learning fun. They truly did, even though I know that their hands were tied. And, but I know that I didn't have a real relationship with those teachers. They still did not bring in their personal beliefs most of the time and, or share a lot of their outside world life. So it was still not a true relationship, but I know that there are still teachers out there that are trying their best to make school fun. Um, So I'm not trying to harp on teachers at all. It's not their fault at all. It's the school system that is just tying their hands behind their back and expecting them to do a really good job with these students when they could be doing so much better if they had more freedom. So again, it's so important to know the difference between a uppercase T teacher and a lowercase T teacher um, because the biggest difference is trying to teach kids something with school standards rather than just teaching them something like a parent would teach their child something. That's why even though I was a teacher in many different settings over the years um, and got my degree in elementary education to become a classroom teacher, I am very wary of classroom teacher types who try to steer kids in a learning direction that's not what they were after at all. I love 
teaching children. And that's why I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a classroom teacher because I love helping kids learn. I know that I would have been very frustrated in a traditional classroom because I wanted, I would have wanted to do things like, let's go outside and take a nature walk. No testing, no worksheets right now. Uh, let's go and uh, watch this movie and, and eat some popcorn and then we can talk about it. There's no assessments for this, you know? Let's, uh, let's just blow off some steam. Let's do some relay races around the classroom. And all of that. And I probably would have gotten in trouble and fired for that. I just would not have been wanted to be held down by all of the rules and the regulations and and all of the the prep for testing that I would have had to do with the kids. I think I would have been miserable. And so that's why I love teaching my own kids because I get to inspire and support and guide my own kids without any of those rules and in the way that works best for them. So I am truly living out my dream of getting to be a teacher. And it's with my own children who I love and and uh, value the most. So it's wonderful. Here's another quote from the book. It says, the true master does not want to make the student into a slave or a puppet, but into a new master. He is not a behavior modifier. He does not move the student by imperceptible steps toward an end which only he, the master, can see. He seeks instead to give the student greater control of his own behavior so that he may move himself toward his own ends. And this is something that I've been talking about on my channel forever, which is giving more empowerment to our child. It's letting them know that they are capable of learning these things. They need to take their ideas and run with them. And it doesn't have to come from the parent always giving them the, the, re, the advice and, and walking them, you know, holding their hand every step of the way. They have the ability. And we want them to know that they have it inside of them to learn and do whatever they want. They are capable. So I love that he says that. It is empowering our children to do their own thing. So examples of lowercase teachers that I came up with on my own was a grandpa who teaches his grandkids how to fish because it's his it's been his favorite hobby for years and years and he's done it for years and years and he knows what it's all about. It's not somebody that's going to grade or rank those children on fishing. He has a passion for it, and he wants to share his knowledge with his grandkids. And that's actually a bonding moment that my kids have had with their grandpa. Another example is a mom who might sew and teaches her kids how to use a sewing machine to make something that they want to make, right? So that's somebody that you didn't get your degree in using a sewing machine, but you have done it through experience. You've gotten really good at making your own things, and now your kids see that and they want to make something. And so you show them how to use it because it's for their own purpose. That's another thing that happened in my household, actually. Okay, so here's another example. I'm very excited about this. So recently, um, I heard about this astronomical society here in town that is a group of people who love astronomy and have a background in studying astronomy, and they have multiple um, sizes of telescopes and they um, their their building is out in the country um, you know we're in the Midwest and so we've got farmland we have corn and we have beans and everything and you drive out into the country and you see this small little building and actually only half of it has a roof on it which I thought was really interesting and you you pull up into the grass and you they have these telescopes just set up there they have them on the ground and some of them are kind of short like you have to bend down and look through them. Some of them are really tall. And then we went into their building, which is just an open air. Like, I don't know if they have a, a, a roof that they put on it during the bad weather because I'm like, everything would get ruined in here. But you go in and it was this gigantic telescope. And what they do is they offer to the public multiple times out of the month to come and look at the night sky. It is completely free, open to the public. They welcome families to come and just look through their telescopes. They're not there to teach you anything unless you have questions to ask. They're there with their resources and their knowledge. 
and they just say, we have these amazing telescopes and we love astronomy and we want to share it with you. So come and look through our telescopes. If you have questions, we'd love to answer them. But we're going to like point them in the right direction to look at the moon. And we looked at Jupiter, I believe. And they schedule them throughout the year based on like the lunar cycle as well. And so we could go and see the full moon when it's a full moon or if it's a crescent moon or things like that. And the night sky has to be clear so they cancel it if it's a rainy night or a cloudy night. And we went for the first time with friends just a couple of weeks ago. And we took the whole family and it was such a great experience. And this is what happened. I went into the building with a couple of my kids and we had to like step up on this step ladder to get up to look through this telescope because it was just gigantic. It was huge. And I asked the man a few questions, you know, because we're homeschoolers and we just love to ask background questions. And so this man actually told us that he taught at our local community college's planetarium for years. That was his career. And he finally, he said that he left teaching a few years ago. And this is his exact quote that he said to me. He said, yeah, I was teaching at the the planetarium for years and years, but I left because teaching got a little weird. And I just thought about that. And I wanted to ask him more, but there were other people in line to look at the telescope. But I really wanted to be like, what do you mean by teaching got weird? Because here he is with all of his background expertise and his history of being a teacher in the planetarium, talking about stars and planets and astronomy. And instead, he quit that so that he could just share his knowledge and his resources for free to the public. I thought that was amazing. That is an example of a lowercase teacher. Somebody that just wants to share their knowledge with no expectation of grading or ranking or labeling anybody that comes to hear what they have to say. Another time we went to one of our local forest preserves and we got a tour of the um, of one of our forest preserves by a naturalist. He took us through these paths in uh, a local forest that we've gone on as gone through as a family before just to walk through the nature, you know, the forest preserves. And he was leading us through and trying to talk to us about the native animals that are around there and the native plants. And I thought it might be a little too schooly and teachery. But what ended up happening was I found out that this guy was so passionate about our local forest preserve and the animals and the, the native plants and just had so much wealth of knowledge to share with us. But he didn't just ramble on and on and on and lecture our children. He talked a little bit and then if one of our kids interrupted him with a question, then he was like, great question. And he, he answered them. And he also said like, oh, you guys asked great questions. So he was really excited to share his knowledge with us. But he also gave us hands-on activities. He ended up, we ended up going over this little bridge over a river and he gave us some nets and the kids were able to catch some things so it was a hands-on experience he shared some things with us but he asked answered our questions that we had and then made it a really fun um, interactive experience for our kids so that's a lowercase t teacher as well okay another example that i wanted to share was there is a former college basketball player that went to our university here in town we're a university town and then he also went on to play internationally playing multiple years in the euro league and was a three-time champion in france he was also a starter and later a team captain for his university team and now he offers basketball camps to teach the kids in our community the fundamentals of basketball but also teaches them about teamwork character purpose and commitment and my son, my oldest son, who loves basketball, has attended multiple of his camps, and he's actually attending one again this summer. So I love that he knows the game of basketball. This guy is passionate about basketball, and he was so good at it. And now he's coming back, and he wants to share his passion and his expertise with kids that love basketball as well and want to improve their skills. Here's a quote from the book. It says, here are all the elements of teaching, the lowercase t. Here are the elements. The task suited to the student's strengths, the feedback and correction, the internalizing of standards and criteria, and with all of this, the vital element of support. 
So in the example of the professional basketball player offering basketball camps, those kids are choosing to sign up, not because they're forced to, they are choosing to do it because they love basketball too and they want to improve their skills. And the basketball player that is running it is not going to assess the players. He's going to meet them where they're at. And if he sees them practicing and doing something in an incorrect way or that something that's not quite right, he's going to give them positive feedback. And he'll model how to do things the right way so that kids know what it looks like to be a great basketball player. And he will also encourage them throughout all of this. It's all about having fun. It's all about the love of basketball. Um, he's not going to force anyone to go. It's not going to be like a drill sergeant, you know, trying to beat them to be the best basketball players there is. He just wants to have fun with them. He just wants to inspire them. He wants to guide them and support them in their love of basketball. And he also teaches them the skills through games, through playing, through a little bit of fun competition and hands-on learning. They're out there not listening to him lecture about basketball. They're out there dribbling the balls and practicing all of these routines that he gives them. Like they are, It's all hands-on, active learning, which is what I love about it. All right, here's another quote. It says, the student, the doer, can only learn a difficult action insofar as he can put the teacher inside himself. He must be student and teacher at the same time. He must more and more grade his own tasks, get his own feedback, make his own corrections, and develop his own criteria, standards for doing these things. Only as he is able to depend less and less on the teacher outside and use more and more the teacher inside, will he be able to do well what he wants to do. An example that he gives is a music student who never knows whether he's playing a note right or wrong except when his teacher tells him so, can't and won't improve from one lesson to the next. And so it must always be the first and central task of any teacher to help the student become independent of him, to learn to be his own teacher. The true teacher must always be trying to work himself out of a job. I've actually heard other parents say this about parenting, right? Like we are trying to work ourselves out of a job, meaning we're trying to teach our children all of the skills that they need to be an independent adult. We don't want them to leave our home without knowing how to do their own laundry and to be a responsible person. Like we want them to be able to take care of themselves. We don't want them to be 18 and they still don't know how to cook food for themselves. They don't know, you know, all of the basic things that you need to survive, right? And so that's what he's saying about teaching too. We want them to be able to teach themselves. I love the example that he gives about the music student. A lot of skeptics of unschooling may think that parents are neglectful of their kids or that their kids will never learn the important things like math and writing. Let me tell you a story about my daughter. She's about to be eight years old, but when she was five years old, she wrote her first short story. She decided it for herself, and I didn't even know she was doing it until she asked me to attach the pages together, staple them together. She's been writing stories ever since. She asks me how to spell words sometimes, but that's it. She also found out about Canva from me, and she started using it to design her illustrations for her books. I didn't tell her at five years old that she couldn't write books until she was older and I had taught her all about language arts. She didn't need it, clearly. I barely taught her how to read at that age. Not even how to write yet. I had not taught her anything about writing before she decided she was going to write and she knew she didn't need my help to do it. So, when it comes to skeptics who are like, you're just, you're just going to leave your children to themselves and, and you're not going to try to guide them in anything? Like, how in the world are they going to learn anything? Well, how did my daughter start writing stories without me guiding her at all? I'll tell you why. It's because she read, I read books to her since she was a baby and she got her own idea to write her own stories because that's who she is. 
And it didn't take any encouraging or coercion from me for her to do that. She wants to be a published author, you guys, and she's not even eight years old yet. That is all her. And I have not tried to step on her toes or try to teach her anything about it that she doesn't ask me to learn about because she can figure it out on her own. She's heard enough stories and read enough stories on her own to completely understand what a story looks like. She understands dialogue. She understands end marks. She understands quotation marks. She understands how, um, how a plot works and how to describe a scene. All of those things were not taught to her by me trying to lecture her. She learned them by reading books and being read to and just having a wonderful imagination to where she has stories that she needs to get out of herself. Here's another quote from the book. It says, the workload for big school, big T teachers in conventional schools is so heavy only because the schools and the teachers believe and soon convince the children that everything that is learned must be taught. So the teachers spend hundreds of hours trying to cope with and outwit the children's evasive tactics. They make children anxious and dependent and then say rightly how hard it is to deal with their anxiety and dependency. So how can we make sure our kids are not dependent on us to learn everything? How can we do that? We can do it by being supportive. Here's a quote from the book. It says, provide a kind of emotional support while they do this exploring and take these risks. It says the supporting adult by being there, by asking questions, by telling the child that he is right when he is, by giving information if asked, enables the child to test, confirm, and strengthen not only his hunches about what words say, but the criteria by which he makes those hunches. So whenever my kids are trying out something new, Sometimes they will ask me like, is this right? Or, hey mom, watch this. Did I do this wrong? And I'll be able to say yes or no. And then just confirming that what they're doing is right and also encouraging them along the way. Um, I really like to encourage my kids and be like, I mean, with my daughter writing stories, I support her by reading her books like I would a regular book. And then I'll say, I loved that story or I loved this or th that about that story. And if she has more questions like, do you like how I named that person or do you like how I added this detail? And I'll say, yes, I absolutely loved it. You have a wonderful imagination. So that's how we can support our children in whatever they want to explore. Here's another quote. It says, we can only learn and then not so much when the student comes freely to us, trusts us, knows that our tests are to help him and not grade, rank, and label him, and that he need not fear our judgment. And this comes back to our relationship with our children, guys. They have to be able to trust us. And that does not come easily if they have been taught and trained not to trust adults that want to teach them with the big T. So our kids have to want to come to us to ask us clarifying questions about things that they're exploring. And they have to know that we are only there to help as much as they want us to help. Another example of this is my son, my oldest son, who just turned 13, that loves meteorology and weather. I do not try to force teaching on him with that because that is his own passion and, and interest. All I've done over the years is ask him if he'd like me to provide him with weather books, um, certain weather books, and he has. He's liked those and looked at those. Anytime he wants us to print him out a blank map so that he can copy weather patterns on it, I you know, I've done that and now he prints out his own. So I, he doesn't even have to ask us anymore. I've given him access to the Weather Channel app and the NOAA website where he can look however long he wants and in whatever great detail he wants at what uh, those things are are telling him about weather. He loves to explore all of that on his own. He does love to come to me and talk about what he's been looking at recently because he trusts me. 
He knows that I'm going to listen to him attentively. I'm going to ask him questions, you know, more clarifying questions about it. And I'm not going to try to like quiz him on it or really test his knowledge about it because why would I, right? I'm going to support him and he can trust me um, in whatever he wants to pursue. Likewise with all of my children, no matter what they want to pursue, I'm going to be here to support them with that. The last quote that I want to share with you at the end of the chapter where it talks about teaching is this, what John Holt says. He says, I hope these chapters have made clear that I am deeply interested in lowercase t teaching. I believe in it and I love to do it. Indeed, one of the important reasons I want to do away with all compulsory schooling and learning is so that I can call myself a teacher and be fully and properly understood. And I just feel the exact same way as John Holt. I love teaching, you guys. I love to do it, but I don't like to do it in the school way at all. Whatever the kids want to learn about, um, whatever questions they have for me, I want to be able to support them, find the resources, have the conversations with them, lead them towards an expert in that if they want that, to be able to ask questions or to be able to go see things, to be able to go experience those things. And I hope that in all of this, you've learned that we really just want to empower our kids uh, to make them feel confident and supported in whatever interests them and so that they can take their ideas and run with them. Let them have the freedom to choose to pursue something or to not pursue something and to work ourselves out of a job. Thanks so much for joining me today. I hope that this was helpful. And if you want to learn more about unschooling and why I love it and believe in it so much, then go and watch this video next.